please know that this show is all about exposing the secrets of St. George, of Southern Utah. Uh, I've mentioned in every show up to this point that most people don't come to Southern Utah for the arts. They don't come here uh, because of the amazing singing or the amazing theater or the amazing dancing, even though we've got a lot of that here. Most people who come to Southern Utah come for the hiking or they come for the sports. This show is all about letting you know what's here. Now, as is tradition, I'm going to be opening the show with a little monologue of my own. I've never made a secret of the fact that I am an actor uh, and I'm actually very surprised that Sean Denovan, who is the owner of the station, uh, who's also become a very good friend, and I hope he stays a friend after he listens to some of my broadcasts, he's been very, very generous with this show. And I walked into him oh, it was a few weeks ago, right before I actually started this show. I guess it was about three and a half weeks ago. And I had been playing around in these recording studios. I'd been learning to do audiobooks and producing and things of that sort. And... I got into the studio one night, and he was here, and I just almost half-heartedly, kind of tongue-in-cheek, just said, hey, can I have a radio show? And I was actually very surprised when he said, sure. And basically, we set up a time, and uh, we started to set up a format at that point. Uh, but I'm very surprised that he did that. Uh, he didn't know me quite that well, and I am an actor, kind of a, a, a maverick. You never quite know what's going to come out of my mouth. Uh, but I am getting better at controlling that. And I will tell you, this is going to be a special show. I've got Mr. Scott here. I call him Josh. It's very, I'm in front of his students, so I am going to call him Mr. Scott as much as possible. But uh, Josh, you and I have been friends for over 10 years now. Uh, we both have worked together not only here at Dixie State University, back when it was Dixie State College, but we've also been working together uh, in many different capacities in theater at other venues as well. And I'm actually going to be using this show as a sales pitch to try and get you to help me out and to do some work with me uh, later on as well in the year. Now, when I got here a little over 10 years ago, I have to tell you that I wasn't sure what I was getting into. I had been a professional actor for 15 years. I'd been working in Seattle. I'd been working on the East Coast. And I had most recently gone away to England to get my degree in directing. And when I was over in England getting my MFA, I applied to over 80 schools here in the States. And it was very difficult to get anybody to bring me out for interviews. A, because I was in England and they had to pay for my transportation, and B, because I didn't have my MFA in hand. So they, they really wanted somebody who either had that degree or a PhD already. So I applied everywhere in the country. I did get called actually for an interview at a place called Centenary in Louisiana, and they actually flew me from England to come out and interview. I was one of three. I did not get that job, but I did get a trip back to the States and back to England where I finished up my degree. But I kept getting rejection letter after rejection letter after rejection letter. And like I said, I'm from the coasts. I had spent a lot of time at the Utah Shakespeare Festival as well as Pioneer Theater Company up in Salt Lake. But I never dreamed that I would live in Utah because I'm certainly not a desert guy. I like the sun, but holy cow, could we please have a little bit more variety? Anyhow, there was this little school called, at the time, Dixie State College. And it was in a little town called St. George. And I remember looking at the job listing over in England and thinking, well, I've been rejected everywhere else. I'm going to give this a shot. But I was so frustrated with all these schools wanting the MFA in hand and being turned down and such that I decided to turn the tables. And I actually called from England a gentleman named Brent Hansen, who was the head of the theater program at the time or had been uh, working quite a bit with the theater program. And I actually interviewed him. It was a lot of fun putting him on his ear just a little bit, but I started asking him questions about the program and what they were looking for and selling myself at the same time. And I ended up putting my application in. And strangely, I don't know how, they actually kind of liked my work and they brought me on to to be a hire here. And now it's 10 years later and I'm part of me is still amazed that I've spent almost a quarter of my life here in the middle of the desert with the tarantulas and the scorpions <laughs> And it turns out with a lot of really interesting, really accomplished artists. And it's been a wonderful journey getting to know these artists. Well, 10 years ago, when I did get the job, uh, it was the summer before the fall. And this was back in 2007. And I remember walking into the building thinking, okay, this is where I'm going to work. This is where I'm going to do stuff. And there was this, and Josh, 
we're, we're live on Facebook, so you can't jump across the desk and strangle me when I say this. But there was this grumpy looking guy who was in the building. <laughs> And he was at the copy machine, and he had this kind of scraggly, uh, you know, goatee beard and what have you. And he looked like he was really not happy to be in the building during the summer. And I was trying to be friendly, so I walked up to him. Nobody else was in the building. And looking back, this was probably a bad idea because he looked like he could kill me with a glare. And I basically said, hi, my name's Michael Harding. I'm going to be working with you. And I will never forget the icy stare I got back. And I don't remember why. it was. You were in the middle of rehearsing, I believe it was, Raft of the Medusa was a play that you were directing at the time. Am I correct on that? Oh, what was I doing? No, I think it was, um, I believe it was Lissa Strada. Lissa Strada? No, okay. I think, I can't remember. Yeah, this is a long time ago. That, that was, in our old age, we just oh, can't yeah. remember back then. Oh, no, uh, Out at Sea. Out at Sea, that's right. Yeah, yeah. I was with uh, a Space Between Theater Company at the time when it was under the direction of uh, John Parkinson. Gotcha. Yeah, I remember you talking about that play. I think you had a bad rehearsal or something, now looking back on it. But I do remember yeah. being just this scared of you at the time. And little did I know that uh, during that year, I would say, uh, you, myself, and a gentleman named Barlow Davenport, who still remains one of my best friends in Utah today, uh, the three of us really kind of became quite good friends, I think, from that point on. Um, now, Josh, I'm not going to ask if you had the same kinds of impressions towards me, who is this strange man walking in and, you know, saying he was going to work there. But uh, it's been my pleasure uh, having yeah, you as a friend yeah. over these 10 years and working with you as well. Now, I've watched you go through quite a journey here. Uh, of course, you started out, you were the shop foreman. Was that your uh, particular title at the time? Uh, yeah, this it was the um, theater media specialist was the t job title. So I did everything in the shop and all technical related, uh, designed some of the shows. Um, this was before, I think you got hired the same time when we got a um, certified uh, technical director. We didn't have one. I was acting technical director at the time. Um, but yeah, as the school was progressing and the program was getting bigger, um, you were hired at hired the same time. Um, as, uh, at the time, it was Brent Ennis. Right. Yeah, Brent Ennis came in as a technical director. I remember we did the orientation together, myself and Brent, and I don't know what his impression of you was at the time, but I remember we were both kind of floating around, and as scary as that first impression was, uh, <laughs> you, you actually were very, very uh, helpful to me. I remember Brent and I didn't even have, uh, Brent Ennis, not Brent Hansen, we didn't even have an office when we got here. They didn't have them ready for us. So I remember we took masking tape and basically taped down offices for ourselves in the lobby. Uh, we even had a little door there. So, <laughs> you know, people would come up. If they started talking to us in the lobby and they didn't knock on our door, per se, then we wouldn't answer at all. Uh, that's basically describing the professionalism we've had over these 10 years. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, it was... That was I'm trying to remember that first meeting, and it was, yeah, I think I remember the. If it was a cold stare, yeah, it was one of my performers got. <laughs> I had to go back and I started thinking about it. The performers had to quit. I, I think he had a drinking problem, oh. and then we had to kick him out. And I had to memorize all of his lines in less than 24 hours. And he had the major role in the in the show. He um, was the raft. Yeah, no, he was. <laughs> um, I'm trying to. I can't. And I don't. To be honest, I don't remember that first first initial meeting. I <laughs> well, remember you, you officially at the, like the first day of that first week of school when you came in. Uh, I remember that and you getting thrown in um, in a show that was already cast. Oh yeah, that was uh, I Hate Hamlet. Yeah. as a matter of fact, which I thought was funny. My degree over in England was in staging Shakespeare, and I to this day I've made no secret of the fact that I absolutely love Shakespeare. And I thought, what a great intro to St. George, I Hate Hamlet. Uh, but but that was a lot of fun. I remember working with you on that. Um, now you said something earlier about how you basically did everything. Mm -hmm. That's one of the things that I love about working with you. Is Josh is more than just a theater generalist. A generalist kind of, you, you have the sense that a jack of all trades, sometimes a master of none. I've been amazed, Josh, at watching you be a master of set construction, set design, lighting, uh, electrics, lighting design, sound design, sound uh, 
basically all of the electronics that go with sound. You've acted in a show uh, for me. I've seen you were Giles Corey in a production of Crucible that I directed. And I've watched you direct. I've watched you do all of this stuff. And now I'm watching you teach uh, these students who are looking at me very stony-faced right now. We'll, we'll get their impression. Um, but that's one of the – you're one of the gems, I think, that we have here in southern Utah because you do it all. Um, yeah, for years, uh, Brent Hansen was trying to get me um, to uh, advance to become a theater educator. He's like, you know too much, or you know so much. You've experienced. That sounds <laughs> ominous, like the KGB. <laughs> know. You know too much. Uh, yeah, he, you know, he was trying to get me to uh, think outside the box. I didn't know really what I was going to be doing um, if I was going to stay in higher education and work that way and and work up uh, to get a degree. Um, but he kept on saying. What, you'd be great as a theater teacher. Um, and you it think took that me was about, a polite way of saying maybe you should apply for a job somewhere else? Uh, or? He, th- he thought I needed to move on. <laughs> and it was probably right. It was just finding the right time, you know. Right. Um, and that was just basically when Russ Saxton, that was who was teaching at Dixie High School, uh, decided to sit down, step down, and and retire. It's like, well, this is be perfect opportunity. You know, let's see if I can apply for this job and get it. Well, and you were a student of Russ's, weren't you? You went yeah. to Dixie High? Yeah, I, I graduated in 96, and uh, so I did theater ever since then. Um, I started at Tuacon uh, when it first started in 95. Mm-hmm. That was back with the, the pageant Utah, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, it was back in the pageant Utah, and they did the 100-year, 100-show. Um, right. actually in 99 shows because there was one uh, show that canceled out because of flood, or it was rainy. It was really bad rain. Right. But, uh, but yeah, that was many years ago. Well, I remember the, the flood was the big thing about Tuacon. Didn't they do Fiddler on the Roof, and instead of the Cossacks coming in and destroying everything, they had them flooded out or something? It, it's quite possible. <laughs> <laughs> I know that uh, for Seven Brides for Seven Brothers, instead of uh, uh, Avalanche, it was a flood. Got it. So <laughs> now whatever works. Yeah. And uh, one of the things I remember about that pageant, Utah, was the lyrics changed? Didn't they have they had different versions each year? Yeah, it, it was a steady progression of right. uh, changing as the script uh, was evolving. Well, I remember it, I mentioned earlier that I really wasn't a Utah native. I mean, I'm not a desert rat at all. Um, but I, the first time I saw Utah, the the lyrics to the opening song was "Because it's Utah," and it was "Because it's Utah." Mm-hmm. And I remember thinking, because it's Utah, my gosh, I mentioned earlier the scorpions and the tarantulas and what have you and the constant heat. And I noticed the next season it was, we've chosen Utah. And I was like, okay, great. That's a little more along the lines of what I'm thinking. Yeah. But yeah. Uh, it, was it uh, odd for you at all stepping in for Russ Saxton, your uh, mentor? No, I thought it was appropriate. Um, you know, he trained me. I knew what he what his legacy was. Uh, I knew his thinking. Um but yeah, I didn't feel awkward or intimidated. I knew exactly what I was stepping into um, because of what he was able to create there. Big shows, um, very a lot of spectacle, and I had a lot of um, knowledge from what my experience through the, the university here and um, my time at Tuacon. Um, yeah, and down in Vegas, I worked in Vegas for a couple of years, and, and I, yeah, I felt like I felt. I'm comfortable on the teaching side. That was probably where I was most nervous. Right. I, I was still needing that um, interaction in the classroom. Well, I, I I don't want to say anything I shouldn't in front of your students, but how has it been making up everything that you're teaching them? <laughs> <laughs> I'm still making up stuff. <laughs> As no. are we all. This is a little lesson for the three here in the studio. These students. Uh, it took me a long time to learn this, but you never ever stop learning. And uh, no, let, let me ask you. And you can go ahead by nodding now. I'm I'm going to be passing the microphone off uh, amongst the three students, so they're not just sitting here bored through the whole thing. Uh, but has there ever been a time when Mr. Scott has said something to you that you say, really? You can be fair. You can be fair. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to be offended. You know me. This, that's okay. And if you're not watching on video right now, they're trying to decide, am I honest? Am I not honest? Do I have an honest answer? Am I even paying attention? I don't know. Uh, but I will tell you, this is something I've learned. Um, all of those things that I thought – I. Thankfully, I didn't say them out loud, but to my teachers where I was like, really? Come on. 
they come out of my mouth as a teacher all the time. And it, it occurs to me that sometimes teachers actually know what they're doing. And uh, I mean this very sincerely. Mr. Scott, he knows what he's doing. So I do hope that you as students are going to take advantage of that. Now, to uh, shift over just a little bit, uh, we've got three here. Uh, I'm going to start with, they actually got to not draw straws, but when I asked earlier who would speak first, uh, both Brooke and Taylor kind of you know, put a glance over at Henry. And uh, Henry, I'm going to give a little introduction to you right now. Henry said he never has a problem talking. So <laughs> take that as you will. Uh, let's see. Henry, you are a senior at Dixie High, am I correct? Yeah, that's correct. Fantastic. And uh, we've talked about how Mr. Scott took over for Russ. Uh, so you've worked with both Russ Saxton and Mr. Scott. I'm not going to ask you to compare. Please, I'm not that cruel yet in the interview. <laughs> but let me ask you, how has your experience been at Dixie High doing shows? You know, it's interesting. I came in as a sophomore um, and I worked with Russ Saxton on Mary Poppins. And then uh, a year later, I kind of got the rug pulled out from under me. Um, and having a new theater teacher step in. And I, I really didn't know how this was going to work. You Notice know? how he put that, Josh, pulled the rug out from under him. Keep uh, going. Yeah. And, um, you know, and you're nervous because you kind of, you, I think in high school you like to work with the same person and grow a relationship. Um, so there's trust there and uh, the talent is known and stuff. Um, but whenever uh, I came back as a junior and I, I saw this new bald guy, <laughs> who's gonna who's gonna be our director um as josh starts doing grades for the finals and <laughs> i i started to wonder you know how is this gonna turn out and um i think it just turned out spectacularly i think uh i think it's great to work with as many directors as possible and i think that the shows that we put put together um have just turned out so well and uh, i think that i i think i had about a, the best theater experience in high school that i could have Fantastic. Well, it, it, Mr. Scott, and I'm having trouble calling you Mr. Scott, <laughs> let me tell you. Uh, but, of course, he was a student of Russ, and Russ was known for his spectacular productions. And they truly were. I mean, his technical proficiency was out of this world. And uh, I remember, if I didn't see the shows, hearing about just how incredibly technically proficient and slick they were. I mean, the guy took on Les Miserables and uh, Phantom of the Opera, as well as Seven Brides for Seven Brothers, uh, all sorts of musicals. Let me ask you, have you had a smooth transition between Russ and Mr. Scott? I think so, yeah. I think Mr. Scott actually has a great proficiency for the technical side of things. Um, for anyone who got to see our production of How to Succeed, the tech on that one was just uh, just amazing, just kind of you know, knocks you in the face right when you get in there. And uh, it, it actually started, like, this school year before the show, all through the summer of working on it, mostly Mr. Scott, but we got to help a little bit here and there. And uh, I think the tech side of things is just as strong, you know. I think our sets turn out great, and especially lighting. You know, you mentioned that he has a, a skill for that, and I, I definitely agree, uh, lighting and I mean, he does the sound for us most of the shows, so I think the technical side's pretty, um, pretty well, you know, solidified. Well, I'll tell you, that's uh, when people go to these shows, whether it be high school or professional, most people think of the actors and the acting that they see. That's theater, but I don't think people understand that for every person on stage, there are five to seven people backstage or doing pre-production that are making the stuff come to life. And one of the great things I'm seeing, one of the reasons that we have a high school teacher, also a theater professional, but also some high school students, is that we really want to focus on this show about the training or on the training that's happening. Quite often you will have students who they think to go into the theater, the only thing to do is to act on stage. But there are so many other things, and you're blessed to have a teacher who's very, very aware of that. Now, you played in How to Succeed in Business. Uh, what was your character's name? Finch? Yeah, J. Pierpont Finch. J. Pierpont Finch. And what's interesting is the way this studio is set up, uh, I've got Mr. Scott right in front of me, and I'm going to adjust that. I'm going to turn away from you, Josh, for a little bit. And then I've got the students off to my left. And what's interesting is when you said that name, you turned your head and you looked at me through <laughs> through the sides of your eyes. And I got a little uh, reminded of that character, that shifty little nit that was uh, Finch. Uh, I don't know if you look at him the same way. But let me ask you, uh, Henry, 
you've done a lot of musicals. Uh, and as I mentioned before, you played Lord Farquaad in uh, Shrek. I'm not sure if I did that on the air, but we were talking to each other, who is, of course, a little short guy. And if you saw Henry right now, you would understand that Farquaad, that's a physical stretch for him. <laughs> um, he's about three times the size that Farquaad is supposed to be. Um, that That's tall, not wide. Yeah. <laughs> uh, don't mean to insult. Uh, so you've done a lot of musicals. What about straight theater? What about uh, uh, straight plays? Uh, yeah, I don't have near as much experience with straight plays. I think, well, as I was younger, I always loved to sing, and so that kind of drew me into the musicals because um, it, you know, get the best of both worlds, the acting and uh, on stage, but you get to sing as well, and I think songs kind of convey the story really well. But um, straight plays, I have a big interest in because I think they're one of the best ways to um, grow as a, an actor, you know, because I think sometimes... As a singer, I can rely on my singing my way through it um, instead of acting my way through it as, as you're on stage in a production. And I think the real emotion that you get from a show comes more from the acting and the performance rather than their beautiful voice. Um, so I, I haven't done any straight plays, I don't think, at Dixie, but we're doing one currently um, called Antisocial by Don Zalitas. And uh, it's a really good experience. I actually almost didn't notice the change. You know, it, it almost feels like you're singing sometimes and you kind of just dance through it. And so <laughs> if you're not watching Facebook right now, he just did a dance move for you. Uh, check it out on Facebook and you'll see some of the dance training that's happening at Dixie, uh, yeah. Dixie High School. Well, that's right. I, I would agree with you. Absolutely. And I do want to talk about that contemporary show while I'm speaking here. If you could uh, pass the earphones over to Brooke. Who has been? I can't tell if she's nervous to get on the microphone or if she's excited to. Can't tell. Um, but I happen to agree with you, Henry, uh, that acting really does come from inside. And musicals are a great place to start. And if you'll notice, the high schools around here, and this is pretty standard throughout the country, they do musicals. A lot of musicals. Not only are they fun to do, not only do they um, give a lot of opportunity for students to move, to act, to <laughs> sing, but they're also popular with audiences when it comes down to it. Now, Putnam, uh, the 25th annual Putnam Spelling Bee. Am I saying that title right? It's Putnam County. Putnam County. I've just been corrected by three high school students uh, uh, very adamantly. Um, now, that one, I understand there was a little controversy in it or some potentially controversial scenes. Uh, what I love about it, and even how to succeed in business without really trying, they're potentially... Um, uh, of, not offensive. No, dated scenes, I should say. We were talking about a song called uh, Happy to Keep Your Dinner Warm, which is sung. Uh, Brooke actually sang that very, very well, uh, her character in How to Succeed. And it really is about the woman being totally happy being at home while her husband goes out and works and climbs the corporate ladder and she's at home cooking the meals. Now, there's nothing wrong with that, certainly. But if you were to present that to a good portion of today's society, they'd say, oh, my gosh, that's offensive or what have you. But I love the fact that, uh, Mr. Scott, this is a compliment to you. You've taken on these shows that may have a different perspective or a dated perspective, and you've actually done them unapologetically. And not to offend, but you're doing the shows. Now, Henry, you mentioned doing straight plays, and that's where the acting comes from. I happen to agree, and one of my favorite favorite things to do uh, teaching in a higher uh, institution of learning is taking the students who have done a lot of musical theater in high school and helping them find what you were talking about, the rhythm in the spoken word. And, you know, I don't necessarily ever want to see that dance move again that you did. Uh, but in, in a well-written play, you do have that psychology in the words. You do have that music. And it, it's always wonderful to see students who were musical stars in high school. Not that that's just what you are but realize that there is more and that that rhythm and that beauty comes from you. Now, Brooke, I mentioned that I saw you play the role in How to Succeed in Business Without Really Trying. I also saw you in a show that some of you may have heard of called Shrek. Now, uh, in Shrek, and by the way, I do have your Shrek in my classes right now, and that was, um, that's Daniel, and he was one of my favorites because he came in as a star, and Daniel, if you're listening, yes, I'm speaking directly to you. Uh, he came in as a star of musical theater. He had played Shrek. And I had a really good time with him the first semester saying, okay, let that go. And let's continue your training. Uh, and he's actually done very well. Daniel, I'm complimenting you on the air. But in that production of Shrek, uh, Brooke Meadows played Fiona. 
and actually quite, quite well. We got to hear Brooke sing. We got to see Brooke tap dance. We got to see a, a lot of music work and some very fine acting. How are you doing today, Brooke? I'm doing really good. Thank you. Fantastic. Now, uh, have you done any uh, straight theater versus the musical theater? When I was eight years old, I played Helen in A Christmas Story at the Electric Theater. And that was eight years old. And I was eight years old, yes. Other than that, I did The Diviners, but I didn't speak in The Diviners. Gotcha. The Mm -hmm. Diviners, for our listeners, tell us about that play. So that was a play that we did last year. That was my junior year, and it was about um, this young boy who had special needs. And basically, I was his angel mother. Okay, that's a great way to to, uh, describe it. I am the angel mother. And I'll just say I'm the devil broadcaster. I don't know that's... Uh, I kind of kind of blocked a special character moment in the play. Um, it's no secret. It says the beginning that uh, the, the boy dies drowning and his mom drown, uh, died drowning. Um, well, great. They don't have to see the play now. Thank you, Mr. No, it's Scott. It's right there at the beginning. Um, so it's not really a, a spoiler. Um, but uh, it's a part where she kind of embraces him and holds him at, at that last moment. Um, so it was kind of special. It was kind of my little signature in the show. I like to tag a little characters, but I wanted, you know, something that was kind of angelic. Got it. And and that, Brooke, so even though you didn't get a line, you did get a moment there. Uh, was it Yeah, fun? no, yeah. It was such a great experience. Any, I feel like any play experience that I've had, whether it's a big role or a small role, that I've really been able to just, like, bond with the cast and – um, gain a perspective on what that show has to offer and bring to my life. And I definitely apply each show to my personal life. Got it. That, that's wonderful. And uh, are you part of this show that Henry brought up, this straight play that's being done right now? Yes, I am a part of Antisocial, and I'm very excited for everyone to come see it. Gotcha. Tell us about it, Antisocial. Yeah, Henry's just sitting back. He's like, I'm done. I'm just going to listen <laughs> to you all. No, we'll get you back on, Henry. Wow. Um, the show Antisocial is a lot about the problems in the technological world with Instagram and social media. Just Everybody kind of watch things. on Facebook about these social <laughs> problems. That's right. Facebook is definitely mentioned in the show, as well as Pinterest and Twitter, just all the main general social medias. Gotcha. And what kind of problems are brought up with this? Uh, antisocial, that's how it, it appears to me, how people are social now. What's the whole purpose of the title? How does it deal with this? Mr. Scott, do you want to answer this question? <laughs> oh, sorry, hoping to get there. Josh is saying, I haven't read it yet. I don't know. <laughs> um, I, it, just taking a, a satire, a lot of these things that kind of pull ourselves away from our normal interaction. Um, like one of those scenes, it deals with uh, trolling, um, where these two uh, people meet for the very first time other than being on online. This is face to face and how they how shocking how they're happy and then their inter- their interaction and um, uh, communication is interrupted by a physical representation of a troll. So a troll comes in and interrupts their conversation and it's tries to take a over. lot of fun. And so, <laughs> and so and they're just yep. trying to have a, a normal conversation with each other but is constantly being trolled at in their conversation gotcha. okay <laughs> so it's, yeah it's giving me an idea of yeah. what to expect when i see this show so it's a lot of it's all it's a straight it's comedy all the way through it's very sad tired got it um and so am i right in that from what you're telling me i haven't read the script yet but is it a bunch of little scenelets about that yeah just one um, yeah there's about seven scenes that deal with different aspects uh of different forms of social media got it and Brooke, what do you play in this? I play a role where I am a wife and a mother, and I'm planning Angelic, a birthday party. I hope. <laughs> and I'm planning a party for my one year old son, and I'm going on Pinterest. And basically, I turn very weird when I go on Pinterest. Okay, I'm not even going to ask how. <laughs> uh, I'm going to encourage our audience to come see how. Sounds good. <laughs> Fantastic. Uh, and Brooke, if you would just pass the earphones over to Taylor. And by the way, uh, Henry and Brooke, you are not done. So I, I'm seeing a little bit of relaxation in the two of you. Not by any means are you done. But Taylor, you're a junior at Dixie. Is that correct? Yes. Gotcha. So d- were you able to work with Mr. Saxton before he left? I was not, but my siblings were. Okay, got it. Are you the youngest? I am. Got it. And how many siblings are you talking? Um, I have one brother and one sister. 
Okay, got it. Did, do you ever feel like you were living in their shadow? <laughs> um, I think, um, I don't think so, because my brother was more involved in Pitt, and my sister was more involved with tech. And uh, just so our, our listeners know, Pit, of course, is the orchestra pit. Yes. That's not the storage bin for the actors when it comes down to it. <laughs> no. <laughs> okay. Uh, so they were involved, but are, are you primarily on the acting side? Um, I've actually had the opportunity to be on both the acting side and on the tech side. I was able to be the choreographer for 25th Annual Putnam County Spelling Bee. Fantastic. As well as basically just Mr. Scott's right-hand woman. I was his assistant director, and I helped with sound, and yeah, it was really a great opportunity. That's what I'm hearing from you guys, and also what I've uh, acknowledged and witnessed, is you get a lot of hands-on opportunity at Dixie. Uh, and you've mentioned that you've gone from the acting side to the, the tech side and such. And you also mentioned that you were a choreographer. Mm -hmm. Actually, what kind of dance training do you have? Um, I was trained at a studio called Premier Dance Center. Um, and I was trained in basically any dance form you can think of from ballet to modern to hip hop to jazz and tap and yeah. Japanese no rhythmic. <laughs> I don't know. That, that's the only one I can think of that maybe you haven't done. Yeah. Um, so I think it's wonderful you're getting the opportunity to choreograph. Earlier, if you don't mind my mentioning this, when I was going through the list, of course, Brooke and Henry, uh, you two are seniors, and Taylor, you're a junior, I was asking what roles you had played. And, you know, of course, you know, Henry was like a Lord Farquaad and, you know, pretending to be small at that point. And, you know, Finch. And he looked at me, you know, through the through his eyes from the side, looking very untrustworthy. And, of course, Brooke, you know, well, I was Fiona and uh, in How to Succeed in Business. Now, something, Taylor, that I really appreciated about you is you said, well, I don't necessarily have the leads, but you were one of the fairies in Shrek. Uh, you were one of the Duloc dancers. Do mm -hmm. I have that right? The Duloc dancers. Um <laughs> As well as in How to Succeed in Business, you were uh, one of one of the secretaries, I'm assuming? Yes. Okay, gotcha. Which was a delightful number, uh, by the way. I had a really good time watching uh, the show all over. And you guys seem to have a, a, a tremendous time up there. One of the things that I appreciated about that is you weren't apologetic at all for the fact that you haven't had necessarily a lead. Now, again, this gets into the training of our students. And by the way, you have a senior year and I see Mr. Scott over there saying, okay, I'm looking at you for roles and <laughs> such. I won't speak for him, but, um, I've put him in a very awkward position now, just so you know. Um, but I've had a lot of friends who, of course their goal, and I'm going to ask all three of you about your goals in just one moment. Um, their goal was to get to Broadway and to be a dancer. And I've been very fortunate to have a lot of friends who have actually gone to Broadway and gone to, you know, many other uh, venues. But on Broadway, they went as dancers. And, you know, some of the times I have a good friend, Andre Ward, and he's been in pretty much every major production you can think of. He's had quite a, a wonderful career as a dancer, and he's one that stands out. But I also have a lot of other friends who went and they worked on Broadway. And I was all excited for them, you know, and when they came back, they were like, yeah, I've been working on Broadway. And I said, well, what were you doing? And they got very, very quiet. And they just said, well, I was in Beauty and the Beast. I'm like, oh, that's great. What were you? I was a spoon. And what a lot of people don't really understand is that those roles that aren't necessarily the name roles, those are a lot of the roles you're going to have to get used to playing up there. Now, there is a, a saying out there, there are no small roles, only small actors. I'm going to tell you, no, that's not true. There are small roles that are boring to play. Uh, and quite often those are in the chorus and such. But, Taylor, I appreciate it. You have this fantastic attitude about that, and you have this spark uh, when you're saying what you've done and what's going to help you along the way. I'm getting into teacher mode here. My gosh. Um, but what's going to help you along the way is your absolute spark and excitement for the fact that you got to do acting, that you got to do tech and such. I have to be quite honest with you, both academically in uh, an institution of higher learning, if you will, uh, as well as professional, you're the kind of person that people are going to want to work with. I just want to point that out to you. Thank you. No problem. It, because you have the earphones right now, um, <laughs> because you have the power, ultimately, uh, what are your goals? I mean, you're a junior. Of course you want to get through your senior year, which is one of the most challenging things anybody can do. Senioritis hits about, what, September in the senior year? Uh, but where do you want to go afterwards? Um, 
we have the amazing in Utah anything you ever want to do like you can find a college for and I think that's absolutely amazing um, my goal right now is to get a good scholarship up to UVU and do a semester of generals and then serve an LDS mission when mm-hmm. I'm 19 and then start the culinary program at UVU. There's an amazing culinary program there and also hopefully minor in drama as Fantastic. well. Fantastic. Well, and I will tell you, uh, theater majors or even theater minors and such, they clean up in most professions out there. I know a lot of parents who are nervous to have their children get theater majors and things of that sort saying, why don't you get a real degree? Well, I'm going to tell you, you want to be a lawyer, get a theater degree. Those people clean up in the courtroom. Uh, Even if it's something like, I don't know if you've ever watched Gordon Ramsay on Hell's Kitchen and such. Uh, He has a little bit of theatrical flair. You're going to go places if you know how to use that flair. So I think that's a wonderful plan, actually. Thank you. And if you would, uh, pass the earphones back to Brooke, who can who really wants to talk, I can tell. Uh, Brooke, what are your goals? So I'm actually heading up to Snow College this fall, and I have an academic scholarship and a theater scholarship. So I plan to be a well, part well. of their theater program up there and to get my generals done. And then I plan to transfer to a different university. Not quite sure which university I want to go to after Snow College. But right now, my declared major is theater, and I'm just excited to go learn and to have new experiences and to be independent. Fantastic. Now, you talked about something that is really kind of the point of this particular show, uh, not on the arts as a whole, but the, the point of having you all here. You mentioned that there were colleges for and universities for all sorts of different things, and also, Taylor, you mentioned that. Um, what I appreciate is that you're taking the time to decide what it is you want to do. And I know a lot of students will go out there in their theater training. They've been a star in high school. And they'll just go wherever somebody accepts them. And you mentioned the different schools. If you want to go into musical theater, and this is just my personal opinion, you should look at Weber State. They'd have, uh, I don't think he's there anymore, but Jim Christian, uh, a very good friend of mine, was a fantastic teacher of that, and they still have a great program. BYU has a really good musical theater program. Um, If you go to University of Utah, and by the way, if they're listening and they disagree, they'll call in. But uh, that wouldn't be where I would send a student for musical theater. I would send them there for really contemporary, gritty stuff. Uh, if they really wanted to work with that. UVU has a really wonderful contemporary but also experimental side. They have a wonderful teacher up there, Chris Clark, who is one of the most brilliant uh, theater minds I have ever known. And uh, that's not just because we went to the same school over in England. Um, And by the way, over there, they called me the next Chris Clark, and I was very, very um, honored by that, but I was also very annoyed by that. I would rather be the first Michael Harding over there. But... uh, But he has a wonderful mind. He has done some tremendous, tremendous work uh, with experimental and such. You come to Dixie State, we don't necessarily have musical theater training here. I mean, you look at me, yes, I'm a dancer, as you can tell by my amazing physique. But why are you laughing at that? Um, (laughs) You'll never be on my show again. Um, But you would come here to work with, say, myself, working with Shakespeare. Or uh, we have... Uh, Dr. Catherine Madero Sosoyeva here, who is very much into performance studies and things of that sort. Uh, So I appreciate the fact that you know these schools have different focuses. And of course, the point of this show, trying to let people know what opportunities are out there for us. Um, So yeah, I I very much appreciate that about you. Uh, Let me ask you, where do you see yourself in 10 years? Well, I don't even know. I probably will be a mom in 10 years. I'll be 28. 28. (laughs) Oh, so old. Oh, my gosh. Your career will be over. (laughs) Okay, yeah, everybody got quiet on that. I guess that's the (laughs) the truth or whatever. If you would, pass the earphones on over to Henry. And that's fine. And Josh, we'll find out where you want to be in, uh, let's say, 60 years. We'll we'll see what happens for that. But Henry, uh, where would you like to be in 10 years? Uh... Probably where I want to be, like, right now, like, on a beach, chilling. <laughs> There's honesty for you. Just, you know, relax. Uh, uh, just somewhere that's not not too stressful. You know, I think uh, I plan to start a family, I mean, I guess in the next five years would be great um, to get married or so. But, you know, I, I know that uh, when you start a family, it can be very difficult oh, uh, no, financially. Oh, no, it's a piece of cake, you know. <laughs> and otherwise. So I think in 10 years... 
I hope that maybe I'll be in a, a bit more of a comfortable situation, whatever whatever field I end up going into. Um, I definitely still want to be doing theater in 10 years because um, I know there's a lot of opportunities in different community theaters and stuff like that. And I have a lot of friends here um, in community theaters that, you know, are re- retired and they're still performing. And I just I love that, you know. <laughs> Well, some, something I tell my students all the time and that, that I've actually witnessed is theater's always going to be there. I know a lot of people sometimes they do have to take financial breaks and things of that sort. And by the way, to all of you parents out there who are thinking my child will never make it as a profession in theater, no, 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 it's totally possible, absolutely possible. It's just contract work. When it comes down to it, you line up your contracts. That's all it is. Um, so it is very, very possible. But, of course, you do have times where sometimes you'll need to take a break if you start a family or things like that. Sometimes theater is not the best schedule for something like that. But theater will always be there, whether it be in a community setting, an educational setting, uh, or even a professional setting. You can always get back in. Once you have that, uh, it's a phrase I'm not too fond of, but once you've been bitten by that bug, uh, It'll always be there. There'll always be opportunities of some sort. Now, uh, you were the runner-up for Sterling Scholar for speech and drama. Is that correct? Yeah. Um, for the Sterling Scholar program at Dixie High School, I competed um, to be speech and drama as well as mathematics and um, general. But I ended up being the runner-up for speech and drama, which I thought was pretty cool because I, I love I love drama. And um, as a child, I had a speech impediment. Um so, I mean, it's just, like, nice recognition. Got it. Well, I'll tell you, theater will knock that out of you uh, it, it, in a lot of cases. When I went to graduate school, and by the way, I'm from technically the south, uh, Virginia, which to southerners is north and to northerners is southern. So we're kind of in that no man's land when it comes to the Mason-Dixon line. But I will tell you, it's, it's up at, no, we, we, it's Dixie State University. I can talk about that. But anyways, um, I'm going to get shut <laughs> off the air That's it, before I even get going. Um, but I'll tell you, I had actually a bit of a southern drawl when I was growing up. And when I went to graduate school, one of the first things they said was, you've got to learn to get rid of that. Not that it's not part of uh, who you are, but especially if I was going to go into Shakespearean acting, which is, of course, my specialty, they said, you've got to be able to let that go. And I'll tell you, how I speak now is not my natural way of speaking. It took a long time. Uh, Not that that was necessarily a speech impediment, but that kind of effort goes into the training of actors. Now, uh, the only time I really start drawing is when I start losing my temper and I stop remembering my training, or it's not necessarily uh, muscle memory. My classes know I'm very serious when I start drawing. Um, and it only makes me a little more upset when they start laughing at my drawl. That that never helps. Uh, but I think that's wonderful that you, all three of you, I hope, will continue with theater in some form. Now, uh, we are running out of time. Unfortunately, I'm having a grand old time talking to you guys. I hope you're having a good time here on the show. Yeah. We have one that says, yeah. And by the way, that uh, the other's nod. Um, I almost burst out laughing, and I'm glad you kept on going. When I mentioned that you were the runner-up for speech and drama, your response was, yeah. And that just kind of made me laugh. That's my nerd humor right there. I'm glad you kept talking just a little bit. Yeah, uh, I'm very eloquent, as you can tell. Very much so. Very <laughs> much so. Uh, going back to Mr. Scott, this is your second year teaching at Dixie High. Am I correct? Yeah. Got it. And um, how is it going for you? I'm not going to ask you where you're going to be in five years, ten years, and what have you. How is it going? Are you still learning? Oh, yeah. I've st- I, I think every bit of uh, time, uh, either it's a show, a class, uh, to learn, um, I've never stopped learning. Um, this year was the first time I did a, a course or a unit on viewpoints. And, um, and explain see- that for our listeners. Um. So uh, Anne Bogart and um, I can't remember her other name. <laughs> Tadashi Suzuki. Yeah, um, we're working with. See, I was Josh's, Josh's teacher for, yeah, for a while. For a moment, um, I I started using it. Uh, we, we did it a practice uh, up at um, the UAC, that's the Utah uh, Advisory Council for Theater Teachers. Uh, we did a lesson with Anne Bogart about how theater movement and structure of uh, doing something that's um, spontaneous. Using time, tempo, um, duration, um, spatial or spatial relationships, and trying to get these students to start thinking outside their, you know, the head and to do something that's organic 
and movement. And so that's kind of the idea behind it. Um, and then we followed up with a mask work after that. So doing mass mass characterizations. Well, I, I want to let you know that unfortunately we are out of time. But uh, that was just a little drop in the bucket of the training that these high schoolers get, not only at Dixie High, but we've got a, a rich variety of training, a rich variety of teachers around uh, St. George. And I do hope that you'll take advantage of experiencing some of their shows, not only the musicals, which are pretty darn good, I have to tell you, but also the straight plays. And this uh, play, uh, what is that, Antisocial? Antisocial. We're having it at the high school on uh, Thursday at 6.30. Fantastic. Well, uh, to all four of you, thank you so much for joining me on this show. I hope, you, I hope you've had a good time. And uh, for everybody out there who is listening, please know the arts are there. They don't have to be a secret. And I hope you enjoy them. Have a great day.